How are we? Good. Okay. So um, I'm going to invite you to something tonight. Okay. I try to extend these invitations to you each week. And so here's your, here's your invitation tonight. Your invitation is this, to participate with an open mind about how we receive communion tonight, okay? So it's a little bit different. I'm going to give you a heads up, all right? It's a little bit different than what we've done in the past. So a little bit later, during our worship time, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper, and we're going to be celebrating it with a unique uh, cup of bread combination you've probably not had before, but um, I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to love it. Yes, pastor, we're going to love it. <laughs> okay, so, so don't let it frustrate you. Don't let it befuddle you. Don't let it discourage you. We are still going to enjoy God's presence through sharing together at the table. Amen? So, want to invite you to that tonight, all right? A um, couple other things I want you to know about. Um, you should be receiving your digital bulletin. We send it out every Friday morning, okay? Uh, it goes out via email through something called MailChimp. So if you aren't getting it, but you're on our list, you should check maybe your, your spam mail or whatever thing filters out your email because in that, in that digital bulletin, everything that we've got going on is in there, okay? So I want to make sure you know that. Also, something else that's not in your digital bulletin that I want you to know about, some very, very dear friends of the Brookings Naz family are moving to California, John and Karen Berry. They're going to be moving here very soon. And so tomorrow after the 1030 service, Mike and Peggy Rupert, are going to throw on what? Is we're going to have steak and lobster, I believe. Oh, it's called Cake and Go. Okay, it's called Cake and Go. Out on the table, when you came in, there's a little table out by the doors, is a little road map. They live very close to the church here. And we're just going to offer a time. If you want to say goodbye to John and Karen, we want to encourage you to do that. It's going to be, again, following the 1030 service tomorrow morning at the home of the Ruperts. If you want to know how to get there, make sure you grab one of those little maps on the way out. I know John and Karen would love to be able to wish everybody to come with them. I know they would want that, but uh, we want to make sure we bless them and pray for them and uh, get a chance to, to pray and, and tell them that we love them. Let's, uh, let's come together in prayer as we enter into this time of worship. Lord God, we are... We are in need of you. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we recognize as we go through our day, as we go through a week, whatever time period it may be, we recognize that, Lord, on our own, we'll fail. On our own, Lord, we struggle. On our own, God, we discover how much we need you. And so, Lord, this evening as we gather in this place, Lord, we ask that uh, you would help us, Lord. You would help us to just set aside the distractions, that we would set aside the concerns that we may have, and that, God, we could just come into this time with, a, with an open heart, Lord, with an open mind, and say, Lord, here we are. Here we are in your house. Here we are, Lord God, in your presence. We invite, Lord God, your presence to just fill us. And we ask, Lord, that in response, we would just worship you with, uh, with truth and with humility and with adoration, God. Thank you. Thank you for this time. Now, Lord, as we sing, as we share in, in the cup and the bread, as we open the word all through this time, Lord, may you hear our hearts and may we hear your voice. We love you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you stand and uh, let's, uh, let's come before God in song.
I want to share a passage of scripture with you tonight. This is from Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He says, on the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. So anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. That is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. We're going to share in the Lord's Supper tonight. And this is an awesome time to just kind of say, all right, Lord, it's been a while since we've done this in our church. And we're excited about this opportunity. But even more than we get to do it, what is most important is that we are drawing near to the Savior. We're drawing near to the fact that God, in his incredible love, sent his son Jesus for you and for me. And he went all the way to the cross to show and demonstrate how much he loves us. God couldn't imagine having this separation between people and himself. And so Jesus, he bridged that gap. 
And now we get to celebrate what he did through his death and resurrection. And I want you to think about that and pray about that. So we're just going to continue to worship the Lord. Throughout the room here are tables with trays on them, and you can take a cup. It's a self-contained unit, so it's got the bread and the juice all together, okay? So just go to any place that you want that's closest to you, take one of those, come back to where you're at, and then we're going to continue to worship, and then we're going to receive those elements all together, and I'll walk you through the process. Lord God, we trust in you to lead in this time. And I pray that our hearts, Lord, would just draw close to you as we celebrate the love, the sacrifice, and the hope that we have in you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
on your cup, if you flip the little tab down, the little clear one pops up and you just peel that top clear one and there's the bread and then I want you to take it, okay? And because I'm hearing plastic peel, you're doing it right. So our Lord instituted this meal. He, he did something new. He did something amazing when he sat with his disciples. And he began to share with them that he was going to give his body for their salvation. And it was a willing choice that he made for you and I. And so we, we take this bread today remembering that his body was given for us. Take and eat. Then if you move the foil back, you see the juice there. It's okay if you spill it on the carpet. It's fine. Don't worry. When Jesus was sitting with those disciples, having that supper with them, he took the cup of redemption, and he said, this cup represents the blood that I'm going to shed on the cross for you. That same blood, guess what? It saved me, and it saves you. And we celebrate that shed blood together, that through the blood of Christ, we have life, eternal life. Let's celebrate by drinking this together. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us in this moment to once again remember what eternal life is all about God, it's not about what we do. It's not about that we've earned it. Oh, God, you provided it through your son, Jesus. And we celebrate again today. And we also, Lord, have this amazing hope. You are returning. Oh, God, we look forward to the day. So thank you, Lord. Thank you for this moment that we can celebrate. God, continue to hear our hearts as we worship your holy name. Amen. Amen. Let's just sing the chorus again.
let's just have our voices ring out. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, oh, my soul, rejoice, take joy.
Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus. worshiped you through our offerings. We've worshiped you through song. At this moment, Lord, we want to be silent and wait on you. Let's just be still before him. Tell him how much you love him. What is a word of truth you've received from him this week? Speak that to him now. Yes. You are peace, Lord. You are power. You've shown us these truths this week, Lord, if we've, as we've walked with you. Lord, I pray that our hearts would be open, open to what you have for us here today. Would you move among us, Lord? As your word tells us that you have dwelt among us. Oh, how sweet. We receive your spirit here in this place. And we know you're not done. So I pray as the word is opened up to us tonight, would you anoint it? And I pray that we would hear only you, Lord, and that our response would be out of complete obedience to yes, you. Yes, Jesus. Because we love you. May worship you here. So have your way as the word is broken up, open to us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You may be seated. You may be seated. Hmm. I want to give you guys a ministry opportunity. Need something to do? 
I got an idea. So since, um, well, March 13th was the, when, when all the stuff went down, right? And we, we changed and, and uh, the, 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 the announcement about COVID happened and all of that. Well, since then, right up to now, we are averaging in our attendance about 35%, maybe 40% of what we were running prior to COVID, okay? So here's where the ministry opportunity comes into play. If you guys remember, there's a passage in the Bible in Ephesians chapter 4 where it says, where Paul is saying to the church at Ephesus, there are some that Jesus actually appointed, some to be pastors, some to be evangelists, some to be teachers, some to be prophets, right? These, these, these places of ministry that had a, a specific function in the church, but it went on to say, so that the body of Christ could be equipped to minister, okay? Here is an easy ministry opportunity for you. I would imagine right where you're seated right now that if you can think back in your memory to four, five, six months ago that there probably were some people that used to sit near you or by you that don't come right now. Here it is. This is profound. Call them. Invite them. People right now are making various decisions about why they should or shouldn't be at church. They are, okay? And I get that. But I'm going to go out on a limb here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a chance on this, Betty. I think I might be right about this. That there are many people that are in your sphere of influence that are probably one phone call away from being invited, and they would say yes. They would say yes. Now, now that, that's not, you know, rocket surgery or heart science or whatever it is. That is, as, that is as simple as ministry can get by picking up the phone or hitting the text and saying, man, I miss you. I miss you. If, if your staff broke up our call list, there's four of us on staff right now, we would all have about 100 people to call every month, each of us, if we were like making monthly calls. Now, we do our best to call and check on people, but think of the multiplied effect that could occur if you all helped us with that. That's ministry. And I would imagine that it wouldn't take a real long conversation and somebody would say to you, Susie, you know, you're right. I should come back to church. You guys try that this week? You give it a shot this week? Yeah. Just give it a shot. See what happens. I mean, the worst they could say is no. <laughs> They're not going to punch you, okay? No, no violence. Nothing like that's going to happen. Um, so just let's just see what happens when um, we just reach out with a heart of love and care and we minister to each other, to each other, okay? That's how the body of Christ does it. We minister to each other. So you never know. Give it a shot. Okay, so um, I want to tell you guys too, I want to tee up something for you that I am like massively, massively excited about. The only people that know this are uh, the staff team, and the prayer team. So starting next weekend, we are going to launch into a series called Breaking Through. If you guys recall, God gave me a word, and we as a church adopted this word for the year, Breakthrough. And God has laid it on my heart starting next week. What does that look like? What does breaking through look like? And, and the Lord, I, I was having such an awesome time with God this afternoon as he was just 
pointing out scripture after scripture where there are powerful breakthrough prayers in the Bible that are particularly relevant for us right now. What would a breakthrough look like in your life of a breakthrough through fear? A breakthrough through anger. A breakthrough through hopelessness. A breakthrough through adversity. A breakthrough through relationship. And I'm looking in God's word and there's like prayer after prayer after prayer where, where these people are speaking God's name and a breakthrough occurs. We're going to spend 11 weeks on the power of breaking through. You guys... Get ready. I'm excited about this. And this series will take us right into, I mean, Advent. We're already talking about Christmas. Can you imagine what this Advent season will feel like and what you will experience individually and as a family when there's been a breakthrough in your life? I mean, stuff has busted loose. Your life has changed. Something miraculous or supernatural happened. A healing took place. A blessing occurred. Power was given. What would that make this Christmas look like? Come on. I mean, look at the year we've had. It's been a train wreck. It's time for a breakthrough. So I just want you to prepare your hearts for that. And we're going to go through each week these powerful breakthrough prayers and how God brought the breakthrough. This isn't make-believe stuff, you guys. This is truly God at work. So to set that up, we're going we're gonna to lay some bricks, okay? We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna build a foundation tonight. And this foundation... Obviously, it's based out of the scripture, but I think fundamentally, we need to understand that in order for us to have a breakthrough, and as we focus our our thinking and our hearts and our passions and everything that we are and the breakthrough that God wants to do in our lives, then fundamentally, we have to understand about the role of the Holy Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit? That's why I'm calling this, this particular message, Ghost Story. Okay, and the reason I picked that, this isn't a ghost story, okay, but it's a story about the Holy Ghost. Now, when I was a kid, uh, when my dad got into the ministry, I'd not heard this terminology of, you know, the Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost. I didn't know what that meant, and, and I remember when my dad got pastoring, his um, Bible of choice was the King James Version. That was his, he was a King James guy, and in the King James Wherever there was the Holy Spirit, it would say the Holy Ghost, right? So I, that's just what I heard to begin with was the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost, you know? I just heard that all the time. And so that's kind of my, my, my first experience with that. But I want us to really take a look and see what is the Holy Spirit up to? Who is the Holy Spirit? How is the Holy Spirit relevant to my life? I mean, Jesus is, is kind of easy to, to figure out. I mean, he was on this earth. I've seen plenty of pictures of Jesus, and so I can kind of sort of relate to that, you know. But you start talking about spirits, you start talking about, you know, even, you know, maybe your Bible still says Holy Ghost in it. What in the world does that mean? How does that impact my life? What difference does that make? So we see the work of the Holy Spirit from cover to cover in the Bible. And guess what we're going to do tonight? We're going to look at a lot of scripture. So I hope you get, get a little finger work out, okay? So if you brought your Bible, you're going to be flipping pages. If you got your phone, you're going to be swiping, I guess. But there's a couple places we're definitely going to be in. John chapter 14, John chapter 16. We're going to be looking in Acts 7, Acts 19, and we're even going to look at Genesis, okay? So those are the places we're going to be moving around, and actually we're going to even be in Isaiah chapter 30. So if you want to kind of put your hands in all those places in your Bible, that might help you, okay? But there's a word that I want us to get familiar with here, and it's a word that's talked about in the Old Testament, and it's a word that's talked about in the New Testament that relates to the Spirit of God. So listen to this. This is in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, 
and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Boy, right at the beginning, the Spirit of God is hovering over the waters. So this, this phrase, Spirit of God, there's a, there's a Hebrew word, and here we go. You got, you, you, we're going we're gonna to sound really Hebrew here, okay? So you've got to clear your throat a little bit. <clears throat> clear your throat. And say this, ruach. You've got to have the ch in there, okay? Ruach. Ruach, okay? Ruach. What that means, Doris, did you say it? No? Not going to say it? Okay. Some of you spit on the person in front of you. You're like, oh, no, put the mask behind me. Yeah. <laughs> ruach. What that means is that is a wind. That is a, a blowing wind. That is, a, um, that is breath, okay? It is, it is the force of breath, the force of wind. So that's the kind of the Old Testament sort of picture we get, a blast of breath or an exhalation of violent wind. It can mean all those different things, okay? But we also see this same meaning in the New Testament. We look at John chapter 14. And this is Jesus talking, John 14, verses 16 and 17. He says this, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. The spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. This spirit of truth, this is the New Testament version of ruach, except it's not ruach, it's pneuma. Pneuma, which means the same thing. Breath or violent exhalation or a, a wind, a violent wind that's moving. Pneuma. Now here's the thing about wind. You can't actually see wind. You can see the effect of wind. You can see when wind kicks up dust, when it blows a tree, when it, you know, well, back in the old times when you used to hang your clothes outside, right? Guys, we, I, I've, I've seen that. That's, that may still happen. I don't know. But you see the effect of wind. That's the same thing that's being described in Genesis 1-2 and in John chapter 14. With this pneuma, this effect of this wind. Jesus had this conversation with Nicodemus, and it's, he's, he's trying to describe to Nicodemus what the Holy Spirit is and who the Holy Spirit is. And, and it's like, he, you don't know where he's coming from like the wind, or you don't know where it's going to like the wind, but you see what the Spirit does. And that's the same thing that's being talked about here. And so this kind of, I don't know, maybe it moves around in your head as in the form of a question where it's like, well, then what does the Spirit do? do? Well, the Holy Spirit, first of all, is not an it. It's not it. Jesus very clearly refers to the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, as a person. A person. The Spirit is a person. It's not an it. It is not this, this, this thing that just sort of is out there. there the, the person of the Spirit is very active, okay? So, the word that we have here, Jesus talks about this a lot, the word that he uses to describe the Holy Spirit is the counselor. The counselor, okay? The Greek word is parakletos. That's, a, that's, like, that's an intercessor or a consoler, an advocate, one who, who stands in the gap, one who represents. Also, it describes one who comforts, one who helps parakletos, okay? So Jesus went on when he was talking to the disciples in John chapter 14 and John chapter 16, he said, it is actually better that I go. Can you imagine that? You spent three years with God in the flesh, and he's saying, it's better that I go. Because if I go, then the Father will give you the gift of the Holy Spirit. And here's the, here's the trouble with that. If I'm given this gift of the Holy Spirit and I can't see it and I can't smell it and I can't tell where it's coming from or where he's going to or all that stuff, why is that such a big deal? Why should I be concerned about the Holy Spirit? Why should I even, you know, figure out, like, what, what does God's Spirit 
have to do with my, my life, my walking, my going, my coming, my going, all of that. So it begs the question, why do so many of us, I'll even say us in the church, live a spiritless life? Why? And I think partly, maybe partly, is we, because of a, a lack of understanding, a lack of knowledge, a lack of awareness, whatever the case may be, we just don't see the relevance. I know Jesus talked about giving us the Holy Spirit, and man, some powerful stuff happened to the, the disciples in Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2, but I mean, that was then. You know, what about now? And maybe you've even said to yourself, you know, my life does kind of seem a little bleh, spiritless. I think the first part of this is it comes down to an awareness where some people are just not aware of the Holy Spirit. Okay? That could be because of a church background, maybe. Maybe a lack of, of teaching or, or exposure. This is one of the reasons I love the Church of the Nazarene. We are very clear in our statements of faith. We are very clear in our doctrine of who the Holy Spirit is and why we should be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's just, we, don't, we don't play shadow boxing with that. We don't you know, soft shoe that deal. It is a clear teaching in Scripture. Therefore, it is a clear teaching in our uh, tribe, let's call it, of Nazarenes, that we have this amazing opportunity to be in partnership with God as he fills us with his living spirit. Now, if that's something you haven't experienced, oh, you're going to love the end of this. You're going to love it. So some of us are not aware of the Holy Spirit. Paul had to deal with this in the New Testament. In Acts chapter 19, listen to this. Acts 19, verses 1 through 3. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they answered, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Totally unaware. It's kind of like me on an airplane. I'm just going to paint a picture for you. So I just flew back from Florida uh, last week. Uh, my daughter and I took a nice, long, really long road trip to Pensacola, Florida. And so I'm on a plane, and I'm coming back. And, and this happens every time I'm on an airplane. Uh, I walk through a certain area of the airplane that I never get to sit in. Yep, first class. And here's the thing about first class. So I sit way back somewhere, you know, where the seat rows just get tighter and tighter and tighter. And, and here's what happens in first class. As soon as everybody sat down, you know what they do? They go like this. They close the curtain. Like all the cool stuff happens behind the curtain. Right? Now, these days of air travel and COVID and all that, I don't know if there's anything special in first class, but they still do the curtain. Okay, They still close the curtain, and I'm sitting back there. Once in a while, when I'm like super bored, and the Wi-Fi is not working on the airplane, I wonder, what's going on behind the curtain? It's the same way in this journey with Jesus when it comes to the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Sometimes it just feels like this curtain's been pulled. And we're like, what is going on back there? What can go on in my life if the curtain comes open? Well, you know what? God's word is going to open up that curtain tonight. And I pray, and I've been praying about this, that your eyes, you would literally experience sight. Sight and awareness of the work of the Holy Spirit that he wants to do in your life. Your life. So maybe the first step is let's get aware. And I'm going to do my best tonight through the power of God's word to make you aware of the Holy Spirit. 
Here's the second reason that I think so many people live a spiritless life. They resist the Holy Spirit. They resist him. Quite intentionally. Don't want to deal with it. And there's a number of reasons for that as well. Um, Acts chapter 7. This is uh, Acts chapter 7 through the first part of 10 is this like incredibly brutal sermon by Stephen. I mean, this guy is letting it fly. Okay, and he probably knows, he may know, this is the last sermon I'll ever preach. So, woof, out it comes. And in Acts chapter 7, verse 51, he says this, You stiff-necked people with heathen hearts and deaf to the truth, must you forever resist the Holy Spirit? You are doing exactly what your ancestors did. So where does this resistance come from? Well, I think part of it is that sometimes we interpret when we say, well, I don't know about the Holy Spirit, or um, I get kind of uncomfortable when we start, like, talking about spirit things, because that's kind of like, ooh, weird, you know, and I, or, or I had this bad experience in some other church, some other time, whatever. Whatever it may be, and it may be associated with some discomfort or, or just some, some uh, lack of understanding. Right away, we, whenever we hear Holy Spirit, we just pump the brakes and we say, nope, not going to go there. Can we just like talk about you know, cool stuff in the Bible? You know, baby Jesus and you know, the Ten Commandments and all those kinds of things. And we just do that. We start talking about the Spirit, and that just gets weird, and so I'm going to resist that. Just resisting it. That may be one reason. Sometimes when we sense in our life, you know, we're, we're following the Lord, and we're, we're trying to be good Christian soldiers and, and, and walk this walk with Jesus, we, get, we may get an interruption in our life. Right? And in, during that interruption, maybe the interruption is, you know, hey, I have this kind of pattern in my life, and all of a sudden it kind of takes a detour. And while the detour takes place, I'm starting to like sense something in my heart or my mind, and it's, and it's uncomfortable or it's interruptive. And because of that, we go, well, no, if this is God doing something, forget it, because I've got my life all figured out. Who here has their life all figured out? I see no hands. But so often, we act like we do have our life all figured out. And when the Holy Spirit is trying to break in, we resist it. Because it's different. It feels weird. It's a change. It's out of my comfort zone. Whatever termino terminology you want to use, we resist it. We resist the movement of God in our lives. So some people aren't aware, and some people resist. So what is it then, what does the scripture say that the Holy Spirit will do? What will he do? Well, number one, as Jesus lays it all out very clearly, he will comfort you. What's not to love about that? Who could use some comfort? See that hand? You guys... The first thing that Jesus shares with us about the Holy Spirit is the very meaning of the word Holy Spirit, the comforter, the comforter. In John chapter 14, verse 16, Jesus says, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another comforter. And the translation may also say another advocate who will never leave you, never leave you. One of the things that could be the most comforting in our lives is knowing that we are with someone who we know will never leave us. Just strictly on a human level. Knowing that that, that partner in life or this just relationship, that that's like, it's tight, and man, I just know they're never going to leave me. But you know what? We're human. We fail. We mess up. The comforter, the Holy Spirit, will never leave you, ever. That's comforting. We know the Holy Spirit will do that. And that abiding, comforting presence of the Holy Spirit will always be with you. Welcome him. 
welcome him. Oh, but that's weird. Get over it. Welcome the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Secondly, what will the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit will counsel you. Counsel you. John 16, 13 says this, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. We have so much, I'm going to call it poop, coming on the computer, on the internet, on the social media, on the TV, on the everything. Garbage, 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 garbage. And we buy it, hook, line, and sinker. And yet the Spirit of God who counsels us, counsels us truthfully, gives us the truth. And I'm going to, I know I am pushing some buttons and some of those of you wearing open-toed shoes right now, I'm stepping on them. Because we think that what we saw on Fox News is the gospel. It's not yeah, what? We think that what we just saw in this, in this repeated abused post on Facebook is absolutely true. That's got to be the truth. The Spirit of God will counsel you into all truth. One of my favorite scriptures is found in Isaiah Oh, I'm turned to it. Great, look at me. Isaiah 30. This was a powerful scripture. This is a powerful scripture, but God has used this in very specific times in my life, and I think this pertains directly to the counseling of the Holy Spirit. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 20 and 21. Um, I highly recommend you highlight this. If you've never underlined in your Bible ever, this, guess what? Tonight, you get to do that. Isaiah 30, verse 20 and 21 says this. Though the Lord gave you adversity for food and suffering for drink, he will still be with you to teach you. You will see your teacher with your own eyes. Your own ears will hear him. Right behind you, a voice will say, this is the way you should go, whether to the right or to the left. Wouldn't you love that counsel in your life? That's the Holy Spirit. You guys, I'm going to let you in. You, my number one fundamental prayer for every one of you, as your pastor, my prayer for you is this. It's very simple, that you would hear God. That's it. That's how I pray for you. You would hear God. Yeah, but pastor, what about this illness I have? What about you would hear God? And that the counseling of the Holy Spirit in your life would be familiar. Familiar. Not weird, not strange, not crazy, not uncomfortable, familiar. Now, sometimes familiar words can be uncomfortable, huh? Yeah. But the counsel of the Holy Spirit would become familiar. I pray that you would hear the Spirit of God. That's my prayer for you. Lastly, what will the Holy Spirit do? And we do not like this one. He will convict you. Ah, see, I knew the church. It's about judging people. That's what you did. Just judging. Convict. Conviction. The, the Holy Spirit has this unique ability, and only the Holy Spirit can do this, to point out those areas in our lives that are an offense to God, are sinful, and at the same time, our heart can melt. Only the Spirit of God can do that. But he will convict you. Jesus said this in John 16, 8. When the Spirit comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin 
and righteousness and judgment. So, so, you're, you're prob- the wheels are probably turning for you right now. I bet I know what you're thinking. So you mean to tell me that in order for me to experience the, the Holy Spirit in my life, I got to like fess up about my sin? Yeah. I have yet to have a spiritual encounter with the Spirit of God without coming face to face with my sin. There's no way I can come before a holy God and just go, I'm good the way I am now. Can't we just like get on with this? And that convicting spirit of God will say, Chris, we have some work to do. And you know where the work always starts? The work always starts with just God creating a humble heart and saying, let's deal with the sin. Sure got quiet. Mm. The Spirit is convicting us not only of sin, but here's, and again, this is only something the Spirit of God will do. Yes, we get convicted of sin. It gets laid on our heart. We, We are exposed before a holy God. But at the same time that that conviction comes, there's this other conviction that takes place. And this is good conviction. This is great stuff. Because all of a sudden, as as the light of God's love and purity is shown on the darkness of our sin, we are drawn into this incredible dependency. I need him. I need him. This is what happens. The Holy Spirit helps us get honest. Honest with ourselves. And so then the Spirit draws us to a place of decision. A decision. And he'll always bring us to a place of decision. This is what I love about the Spirit of God. He will never twist your arm and force you. That's not the nature, that's not the character of our God. He draws us to a place of decision. This helps us not have a hard heart. And one of the things that is so resistant to the Spirit of God is a heart that is hard. No, I want it my way. Mm. We get a hard heart. Has your heart become hard? What are you feeling conviction about? What counsel has the Holy Spirit spoken to you over? What comfort has the Spirit of God brought to you? So here's the question. This is the question that I know is on your mind right now. I know it is. How can I receive the Holy Spirit? That wasn't just an Acts thing. That wasn't just a Bible times deal. The Holy Spirit of God is active and moving today. He is giving gifts to men and women today. He is purifying hearts Today, he is giving holy power today. He comforts today, he counsels today, and he convicts today. And he will do it tomorrow, and he will not stop until the kingdom of God has fully come. So how can you receive the Holy Spirit? Well, one Believe this message that you have just heard from God's word. Do not leave the building saying, yeah, well, that's for them church people. That's the super holy people. They're the ones that get the Holy Spirit. I'm, I'm just, I'm in the riffraff. I don't get the Holy Spirit. God has given the Spirit to everyone. Everyone. To your children, your children's children, 
multiple generations he has given the Holy Spirit. So believe the message that you have heard. Secondly, this is, this is, I can't believe how easy this is. Ask the Lord to give you the Holy Spirit. Ask him. He willingly gives it to you. He will give you the Spirit. And here's the thing. Here's the thing that's interesting. When we become followers of Jesus Christ, here's how we describe it in the Church of the Nazarene. We call that, okay, stay with me, we call that initial sanctification. What do I mean by that? When we confess our sin before God, and he saves us, he purifies our heart, cleanses our heart, forgives our sin, all the, all the past is redeemed, and we're brought into the family of God, we have the presence of Christ in our heart. Make no mistake about that. But what I'm talking about is allowing the Spirit of God to have complete, full sway over your life. No more like bargaining with God. I bargained with God for probably the first 10 plus years of my walk with him. I loved God, loved him a lot. Loved, loved the church, and my, my kids who were very young at the time were getting them into church, and, and we, you know, we're doing that. And I'm, and I'm trying to learn God's word, but here's what I did. I kept making bargains with God. I kept trying to, you know, work deals with God. And most of the time, those deals involve that I wouldn't have to, like, do, you know, anything difficult for myself. If God could just, like, snap his fingers and poosh, do that, then I'm all in. But when I was asked to do the hard thing or asked to go deeper with God, which meant I had to, like, give over pride or, or ego. You know what ego stands for? E-G-O, edging God out, just in case. You, that's, a, that's a free one right there. I had that going on. And I came to this point. Oh, man. July 13th, 1996. For me, I can remember, I can remember what it looked like outside. I can remember the environment. And the Spirit of God said to me, Will you submit to me? That was so clear. And it involved me saying, you know what, God? I am done with the deal-making. I am done with the bargaining. I am done with the wrestling. I am done with the up and the down and the up and the down. God, it's got to be better than this. If this is the sum total of my walk with you, I can't do this. And then he's like, exactly. You're not supposed to. Let my spirit do that. And it was this step of full Surrender. That's what I'm talking about. Surrendering completely to the Holy Spirit, I will tell you guys, it will radically change your life. So believe this message that you have heard from God's word. Ask the Lord to give you his spirit and then thank the Lord for the gift he has given you. And then say, all right, Lord, here's the deal. <laughs> Here, here's the deal. I'm still making deals. If you will allow me to fully surrender to your spirit, this one big yes I'm giving you, then help me every day of my life to say a bunch more yeses. And, I, and I'm, I'm beginning to understand that that's what the spirit-filled life is all about. I remember saying that big yes, but there are still times when I get challenged, I get tested, I, I, I have the, uh, what is it, the water of adversity and the food of suffering, right? I still experience that, but in those times where in the past ego and pride and fear would raise its ugly head, God, through the power of his spirit, working this cleansing work in my heart enables me one more time to say yes. Only by his grace. Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? The same question that Paul asked those new disciples is the same question that we are confronted with tonight. Have you received the Spirit of God since you believed. I'd like you to pray with me.
Heavenly Father, we are in awe of the truth of your word. And we, we see, God, through, throughout Scripture, cover to cover, that the work of your Holy Spirit is ongoing. And Lord, maybe tonight, maybe tonight, someone is encountering this, this moment of decision as your Spirit leads us to. And I ask God if, if, if anyone, if anyone is wanting to receive the fullness of your spirit, Lord, would they simply by faith ask, ask. And God, you will be faithful to answer. So Lord, just in, in this time as we conclude, I, I just, well, I'm just going to leave this open for you, for you to do your work. And that God, in these moments, in these moments of worship, in these moments of prayer, in these moments of just allowing, just allowing the truth of your word to soak into our spirit, that God, we would hear that voice behind us, comforting, counseling, maybe even convicting. And we would respond obediently if you want to come pray you can do that if you're sensing God moving in your spirit and maybe he's calling you to some sort of response tonight some sort of response whatever it may be come and pray come and pray if you want somebody to pray with you somebody you trust somebody that you know will, will just encourage you and help you pray grab them by the hand say could you come pray with me can do that let's just allow the spirit the beautiful presence of God to just minister in this time as we sing would you stand with me and uh, let's just come before the Lord
stop working never stop never stop working even when i don't see it you working even when i don't feel it you working never stop never stop working never stop never stop working way baby you in the world you promise me His name, people. Woo! God is good. His spirit is good. He longs to give you days and eternal days of refreshing. His spirit longs to join with your spirit. God has begun a good work in you, and He will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. He has called you His own. Let His Spirit fill your life. There is no substitute. If you still question, we will pray for you. I will pray for you. God longs for His, pres his presence, His Spirit to have total sway in your life. May the peace, may the comforting power of the Spirit May his counsel and even his conviction rest over you, his chosen people. God bless you. May his peace be with you. Amen. 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 Yes. Yes.